Sense. So, uh, if you could, next slide. Uh, t- today's sermon is entitled "Mothers and Butterflies," and I'm going to be reading out of First Samuel, First Samuel chapter one. We're going to be looking at at, at a, a woman by the name of Hannah, a, a woman by the name of Hannah today. Um, there's, there's. I, I have a kind of a, a, a special reason for wanting to 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 to, to talk about Hannah. Um, and I'll get I'll get to that in, in a few moments. But if you're if you're open to the scripture, First Samuel chapter one, I'm gonna, just going to read verses one through eleven right now. And you have to bear with me because some of the names are hard. Okay, there was a certain man of Ramathaim, Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeraham son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, and Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for uh, this day, this beautiful day, another day of life that you've given us. We thank you for the mothers that are, that are here, the mothers that, that, that are not here, um, our mothers, the mothers around the world that, uh, that, that, that give us life through you. Um, we thank you again for, for each, each one of them, and, and we, we remember them this day, knowing um, that, that they hold such a, a special place in, in your creation and in our lives. I thank you again for the words this morning. I pray always that these words are not yours, um, are not mine, they're yours. Um, I pray that, as we always do, that the, that my, the message uh, would go forth boldly, that you would use me as you see fit to, to deliver this message, and that you would open up hearts and minds to what you have to say to us through me this morning. And as the psalmist tells us, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So today is the day that we set aside to honor mothers, which is something that we should be doing every day, right? Amen. We should be Amen. honoring our mothers every day, right? And it's really, obvious. it's so important to remember all that they, that, that they do do, right? Uh, but Mother's Day can be a difficult time for, for, for some. Um, some have lost their mothers in recent years. Um, some have lost a child, okay? can be a difficult time. Um, some mothers have, uh, are the mothers of prodigal children that have gone astray. Um, then there are mothers that are out there that are going it alone. All right? That the uh, absentee fathers or perhaps a, a father who are, has, has, is deceased and the, the mother is, is going it alone. But, you know, we can't stress enough 
the impact that, that moms have on their children. You know, growing up, I can see, I look back and I can see t today, you know, with in, in my own experience that, you know, sometimes being a mother is not a walk in the park. I'm reminded of a story about this father. He was trying to explain to his daughter, he was trying to explain marriage to his daughter. His daughter was four years old. And he was trying to explain to her what marriage and what the wedding was all about. So he takes out their wedding album, all the pictures, right? And he starts flipping through them and choosing different pictures and trying to explain what, to the daughter what's going on. And when he was finished and he got to the, the la that last picture, maybe it was the, the entire uh, wedding party, or maybe it was just he and, 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 and his wife, right? He turns to her and he looks over at her and he says, do you have any questions? And she pointed to this picture of the wedding party. And she asks, and she says, Daddy, is that when Mommy came and worked for us? Ah, <coughs> uh, but I'm bum. Now, Scripture does have many different descriptions of motherhood. When you sit back and, and read through it, Moses' mother, right? Remember Moses' mother hid him because he was a special child. He was a beautiful child. And then she put him in the basket and sent because because the Pharaoh wanted to kill all the all the, the young the young newborns, right? Um, there's if remember the story in in uh, with Solomon and the mother and they were disputing over whose child it was all right and the one woman said it was her child and the other woman said it was it was her child and there's this dispute and Mo, and uh, Solomon had to come up with a uh, uh, a brilliant way of deciding it and it turns out when you read it it says that um, that she was willing to have her, her son taken away rather than any harm to come to that to that child there is the mother of James and John right remember them that they came she came up to Jesus she loved her son so much that she wanted them to sit at Jesus's right hand and left okay now she got the scripture all wrong, okay, but nevertheless, she went. She she loved them that much. There's um, there's Proverbs 31. Most most of you know Proverbs 31, an excellent wife. It talks about right. But the interesting thing about about um, Proverbs 31. In fact, I even thought of preaching on that this morning. All right, it was written not by Solomon, but by uh, King Lemuel. All right. Um, and the first verse of Proverbs 31 tells us that Proverbs 31 is advice that he received from his mother. And then when you read the rest of it, he says, an excellent wife who could find and, and so forth. But he received that from his mother. So, we're going to talk about moms today. When I grew up, I grew up in probably a, a decidedly middle-class neighborhood. My mom stayed home while dad went to work, while he, he foraged and, and, and did all those things, right? And most of the moms in the neighborhood did the same thing. The moms were mostly home and, and the dads went to work. My dad was a butcher. He was blue collar, as they would describe it. And seeing that most of the other dads in the neighborhood were white collar jobs. They went to offices. They flew around the country on business and so forth. So it was kind of it was kind of different. But we lived well. We didn't have the fanciest house. We didn't have the newest cars. And we didn't have a lot of the other extras, it seemed, that, that the others had. But we managed, and Mom took care of us. She probably stretched a dollar as far as it would go each, each day. Right? And she was always there for myself and my brother when we got home from school, and she fixed dinner. Right? And later on, when we got older and we were sort of able to take care of ourselves, she did go back to work, but she was always home to make sure we did our homework and to make sure supper was on the table. And now today, 
she would probably be looked down upon. And I'm not saying that that is the way that things ought to be, but she was okay with that. She was okay with that. I think that that's what she thought and felt as though that she wanted to do in, in life, is to be uh, a mom and uh, a spouse. Now, growing up, I'm sure that you've had conversations with your own moms about life and things, and mom nurtured and guided and so forth. You know, I don't really remember too much about what my mom said to me as far as earthly or, or worldly advice. Those, those mother's words of wisdom or pearls of wisdom, I don't really remember. But, you know, fortunately for me, my, my mom is still, is still around. She's 94. She's going to be 95 in a short period of time. Joan's mom is uh, 99. She's 99 and looking good and doing fine. All right? She's doing all right. But, you know, I think about some of the things that my mother said to me, and it seemed like it came straight out of the mom's handbook, the mom's playbook, as it were. And maybe you can probably relate to some of this, right? First thing is, is that my mother taught the importance of prayer. For instance, if I spilled something on the rug, my mother would say, you better pray that I can get that out and it doesn't stay in the carpet. <laughs> right? My mother... Huh? Yeah. My mother was a master of logic. She was. Every time I asked her why, her response was, because I said so. That's why. Perfect logic, right? My mother was always concerned about the future. When it was time to get dressed in the morning, she would always tell me, make sure you wear clean underwear in case you get into an accident. Always concerned about what was going to happen next, right? And, and she had a knowledge of meteorology, of, of predicting the weather, because my room always looked like a cyclone hit it. Right? How about this? When we ate... You always finished what was on your plate because why? Because there were starving children in the world that would love to have what you, what you have. And whenever we would go out visiting relatives, there was always this anticip anticipation of going home because she would always remind me and my brother, just wait until we get home. Right? There was this anticipation about getting home, right? And on top of that, there was always something waiting for us when we got home. You'll have to think about that one for a second. <laughs> My mother, I, for the longest time, I thought she was a doctor. Because if I ever made a face or stuck out my tongue, what would happen? My face would stay that way if I kept doing it. She had to have known something about medicine, right? She was concerned about global warming long before anybody else was concerned about global warming because if I left the door open, what? What are you doing? Heating the neighborhood? Or air conditioning, right? Air conditioning, right? And living in a barn. That was, that was the next one, Bert. <laughs> living in a barn, right? You know? And perhaps you probably know some of those pearls of wisdom from your own mother. But I will tell you this, one thing is true for myself, that when I got, as I got older, I did understand, just as she had prophesied, because she always used to say, one day you'll understand. One day you'll get this, and you know what? I did. But all kidding aside, this mother's day, I can't say more, I, I, I can't say enough about my own mother. And I was blessed with another, another mother when I married Joan. As a matter of fact, one of the best pieces of advice that my own mother gave me was the day that she met Joan for the first time. Joan came, came over to visit, and I introduced my mother to Joan. 
And then when Joan left to, to return to, her, to home, my mother turned to me and said, if you don't marry her, you're crazy. Huh? Not great. Well, not entirely. <laughs> but you want to know something? <laughs> okay, you now we're both crazy. Well, you know, they say what they say is that when you marry the clown, you get the whole circus, right? Huh? That was true. Oh, I, I don't have to worry about anything at all. You know, I will tell you this. When I was about six or seven, and we lived in, in West Caldwell, um, there was this open field near the house that, as kids, we used to go and play. Romp around the, 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 the field and stuff and that. And one day we decided that we wanted to catch butterflies. And so I found a little jar, and we went out, and I was able to catch a butterfly in the jar, and I... It was purple, if I remember correctly, but you know, it could have been a monarch butterfly, but anyway. And the lid, I poked some holes in the lid so that air could get in. But the jar was small, and the butterfly's wings, when they were outstretched, kind of like just about touched the, the glass, right? And I brought the, the butterfly home to my mom to show her. And she looked at it. And she said to me, she said, don't you think that that jar is, is awfully small? She said, don't you think that the butterfly would be much happier back out in the field where it had room to fly? And I picked up the jar and I looked at it and I looked at the butterfly just motionless in the jar. And I could almost sense its sadness. And so I decided to unscrew it and let the, the butterfly go. To go and to be able to do the things that God designed it to do. Not to live in a jar. So, our reading for today. 1 Samuel chapter 1. We meet this woman by the name of Hannah. Now, this is a Mother's Day message, but I really do believe that the message of Hannah, the lesson that she could give us, I believe that it applies to all of us. And I chose this section because of verse 27, if you read ahead. And verse 27 says this, For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Joan and I had that verse printed on cards when Michael was born. And it's always been kind of a, a special place in our hearts. So Hannah, she's married to a man named Elkanah. We read that Elkanah had two wives. Hannah, whose name means grace, and Peninnah, whose name means jewel. We read that Peninnah, she could bear children, but Hannah could not. But we also read that Elkanah, the husband, loved Hannah. And I'm going to speculate here, but I think that Hannah was married first. He married Hannah first, and he loved her. But when he noted, or when he realized that she could not bear children, okay, because of the society that they lived in, he then married this other woman, Penina, who could have children, but he continued to love Hannah. We read that Elkanah was a devout man. He would go to the temple to worship and to sacrifice. We read on the day that he would go to sacrifice, he would give portions to Penina and to her children. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. Even though the Lord had closed her womb. 
Now, I'm not even going to speculate as to why God chooses to do things the way that he does them. Why are, so, the, the women, why are some of the women's wombs closed, closed as they would, they would say? I don't know. Okay? But when you read through scripture, the women that are described as having a closed womb or past childbearing years, it's generally that way until God intervenes. For whatever his plan is, he has one. And then we read about these two women. Peninnah provokes Hannah. She taunts her. Not only was Hannah unable to have children, but she was ridiculed year after year by this other woman. Verse 7 tells us that Hannah wept and would not eat. And then her husband comes over to her and tries to comfort her, and I guess not doing a very good job about it. Okay, But he does come to her. But what we find here is that Hannah knows something that her husband Elkanah does not know. All the wives in here are probably nodding their heads anyway. That, that's true in any case. But she knows something that her husband doesn't know. And she knows that the source of children is not from her husband. The source of children is from God. Psalm 127 verse 3 tells us, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Right? And we, can, we read further in verse 10. It says that Hannah was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. This is when I like looking at other translations because the King James Version translates that as the bitterness of soul or bitterness of the soul, which gives you an idea of, of how agonizing this, this was for her, how, how much stress she was, she was under, right? But one thing that we know is that Hannah knew to go to the Lord in prayer. And so the first thing that we find out about Hannah is that she was a prayerful woman. She makes a vow. She says, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. Since children are a gift from, the, from God, Hannah wanted that gift. And so then we read, while she's praying, Eli the priest is watching, and he sees her lips moving, but no, nothing is coming out, so he thinks. And so naturally, I guess, he thinks that she's drunk. And Hannah tells, her, tells him, no, Lord, I am a woman in a troubled spirit. All right? I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. And she says, do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. I'm pouring my soul out to the Lord. And so Eli tells Hannah, go in peace and the God of Israel will grant your petition that you have made to him. And then she says to Eli, let your servant find favor in your eyes. And then the woman, Hannah, went her way and ate, and her, voice, her face was no longer sad. Her countenance was lifted. She was no longer sad. She went to, the God, to God. She worshipped. She wept. She prayed. But importantly, Hannah believed God. So what we see next is that Hannah's faith was strong. And so Elkanah and Hannah, they return home. And we read that Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. The Lord honored her prayer. And then we read, in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. And that name Samuel comes from the Hebrew, which means heard of or heard from God. Whenever you, generally, whenever you see in someone's name that E-L, 
That's God. So it's a descriptive part of the name. And so then we read further that when it came time to wean the child so that Hannah could uh, bring him um, uh, so that he may be, may be appear be, uh, in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. So she was weaning Samuel and that she was able to bring him to the, to the priest. So she fulfilled the vow that she made. She had made this vow in the presence of Eli, but more importantly, she made the va that vow in the presence of the Lord. And so she takes Samuel to the temple, to, the, to Shiloh, to the Lord. And she sees Eli the priest there. And it's basically, it's like, do you remember me? I was that woman all, the, the, all that time ago. And she says, oh my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who was standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. And in effect, what she's saying is, here is the child that I prayed for. And then comes verse 27. For this child, she says this, for this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And then in chapter 2, Hannah prays again. I'm not going to go into the entire prayer, but when you have an opportunity, Look at it, chapter 2 in 1 Samuel. But it's the first verse that catches me. Where Hannah prays and says, My heart exalts in the Lord. Okay? It doesn't say that she prayed and was exalted the Lord when she got pregnant or even when she gave birth. But she exalted the Lord when it was her opportunity to hand the child over to God. Hannah rejoices that God has answered her prayers and that she has been able to fulfill the promise that she made. And Hannah understood and trusted in Proverbs 22.6 where it says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Hannah's work was done. She released him to the Lord to do the work that God had created him to do. Just like that butterfly was released. And we follow Samuel later, later through, through this book that bears his name, that as he grows, we read, the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. He grew. Samuel continued to both grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. So, this message celebrates Hannah, the mother of Samuel. But it celebrates, I hope, mothers that have taken it upon themselves to nurture children to release them into the world. As I think Robert prayed this morning, we look out at the world and we see problems. We do. We need to be able to nurture children in the Lord. To be able to make wise choices. To grow in stature and character like Samuel does. If you follow his life through the, 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 the other chapters to see what kind of a man he was. We celebrate mothers. We look at Hannah. For her, it was a life that was difficult. But through faith and prayer and keeping a focus on God. She did the things that she was designed to do. But really, when you get down to it, this is a message for all of us. 
Scripture tells us in many places for the older women to bring up the younger women, for men to come up alongside each other, to come up alongside the young men, to be a mentor. We have to ask ourselves in closing, what is our focus on? Is our focus on the next generation? Because Hannah's was. And the next generation after that. And the next generation after that. Now, mind you, the people of Israel, they didn't do such a good job. Okay? They didn't. I will say this right, right off the bat. And Samuel, he did what God required of him. And he kept his eyes focused on God's promise, which was fulfilled in Jesus. But unfortunately, many of them ignored his messages. But we have to ask ourselves again, what is our focus on? What are we passing on to the next Samuel? We've had them pass through this church. For those of you who can remember that there were and are godly young men and young women who have moved on. We've released them as we've released butterflies, but we have. And we are praying for more to come up. Where will we be? Who are the Hannahs? And Elkin was a godly man as well. It was really nice to see that he and his wife would go and they would worship and sacrifice together. So when we look at, at Hannah, she was a woman of prayer. She was a woman of integrity. She kept her promise. She kept her vow. And she was a woman of faith, always trusting in the provisions of God. To all the mothers out there, I thank you. I thank you for... for for a, a, a job where many will say, um, well, where it seems to be under attack, and I don't want to be political about this. But you are to be honored for doing what God designed you to do. Amen. Father God, we do thank you so much for allowing us to come before you this, this, this morning. We thank you again for... For people in Scripture that we we, we get to meet and, and to get to uh, get to watch and, and observe their lives and, and and learn from them, we thank you for for for, for women and mothers like Hannah, uh, who raised her child in the way that he should go. And now we get two thousand years later, we get to read about him. I thank you again for my mom. I thank you for the other moms in, in my life. And I thank you for the moms that, that are here. I ask that you would watch over them, guide them, um, and, and just um, and continue, to, continue to bless them. And I say this all uh, with, with dads and, and men in mind as well, that, uh, that, that, that we're all in this together and that we should love and, and honor our, our wives and the, and, and the women that, 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 that are moms. Um, I thank you again for this, this message. I pray for each one here. Um, go out, fly, and do the work that, that, that God has prepared each one of us to do. Um, and that in all the things that we put our hands to, that you would be glorified. We thank you for Jesus as we w await his return as we await his return, and it's his, in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. And we have another song.